Take your Bible, if you will, turn with me to the book of Genesis, chapter number three. Genesis chapter three. And I'll tell you what, God is good. And, uh, man, alive. I think that that property would go and be for sale is amazing. And uh, it is exciting. And, uh, you know, we are very blessed to even be able to think about, you know, we do have that surplus money that he was talking about. And maybe it's the Lord would allow us to use some of that surplus for that down payment, if that's what the Lord wants. And, uh, but no matter what, just to be in position to be able to purchase it is fantastic. And uh, the Lord is good. The Lord is good. Now, uh, we're going to be looking here in Genesis chapter 3. Remember last week, the big deceit. The big deceit. Oh my, the devil came along and deceived Eve and he was subtle more subtle than any beast of the field yea hath God said we may eat of the fruit she said and uh, then he said you shall surely die and uh, oh and then uh, Eve took that fruit and ate of it oh my what a terrible terrible decision Amen. then she went to Adam and said Adam look at this you need to eat and uh, sure enough, he did eat, and we're going to talk a little bit more. Was he deceived? Well, the Bible tells us a little bit later he was not deceived. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. When we sin, you know what happens to us? We hide from the presence of the Amen. Lord. Right. And, uh, but, you know, God still knows what's going on. He sees everything, and he begins to question them. And he said, I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself, he told the Lord. And uh, God said, who told thee that thou was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree? And then he began the blame game like we do. Uh, the woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. And, and as you read on that, then it goes to the woman, she blamed the snake. And you know, when we sin, we often don't take personal uh, accountability for that. We blame it on somebody else. And it gets worse and uh, because there's consequences for our sin. Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. Then we get to verse 17. It's going to speak to the man. It's going to speak to Adam. And in some ways, it's speaking to us thousands of years later. And let's do this. So we could, in honor of God's word, stand. And I'd like us to read in unison verses 17, 18, and 19. All together in unison, starting in verse number 17. Ready? And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. And uh, boy, there's consequences for sin. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread. And uh, the title of the message tonight is The Sweat of Thy Face. Uh, the Sweat of Thy Face. Did I say brow? I said, if I, you always get that mixed up because the Bible says the sweat of thy face, and I think we've been programmed to say the sweat of thy brow, but the King James Bible says the sweat of thy face. Amen. And before we go any further, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we have a men's meeting sort of tonight, and I'm going to try to speak to the men. And uh, Lord, you looked at Adam, and uh, boy, he sinned, and there was no excuse for it. And because of the sin, there was consequences. And Lord, I pray that you help us to realize that, you know, we have some, uh, some residual problems because of his sin. And Lord, I pray that you help us to realize your mercy tonight, but also help us to realize that one day we're going to go to be with you. And Lord, I pray that you bless tonight. We need you and love you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Have you ever sweat? And uh, yeah, and praise the Lord. I was thinking about the sweat of thy face, and I was trying to remember. I was I was remember as a kid working in a kitchen. I worked at a Chinese restaurant, and man, it got hot. 
I, I washed dishes with that hot water, and I mean, I would profusely be sweating, and uh, one of the benefits of eating or working at the Chinese restaurant was I was allowed to drink as much soda as I wanted, and I went over there, and I'd be sweating up a storm right there, and I'd go get me some soda. Uh, I remember working in the attic. Have you ever worked in an attic? And uh, boy, my old house in uh, Bonnydale Road, built in the 1950s, crawling up in that attic, and you get up there and the temperature just raises, you know, 10, 20, 30 degrees. And after a while, you, you don't realize, but you're sweating profusely and it drains you of your energy. I remember working on a hot roof. I did torch down rubber roofs and man, that torch is going. You're going up there and the roof is so hot you can barely touch it. And uh, boy, your knees become, uh, sometimes I've blistered my knees being uh, on there through my pants. And I, I remember tor getting torch going like that and the hot tar spilling over on my hand and uh, just uh, all of a sudden it grips my hand. There's nothing you could do, just burn. And it hurts right there, but you're sweating profusely. And uh, then I remember really thinking recently, what have I done? And I caused me a lot of sweat. I remember maybe two years ago, I was out there working and putting up a fence in my backyard and I was hammering my fence posts in there. And I'll tell you what, it was the, I got on the scale after I got done working, it was the least amount of weight I'd weighed in years right there because I sweated all my, uh, now how much did I weigh? I still weighed 212 pounds. And so praise the Lord, the sweat of thy face. Now look back at verse number 17. Uh, the proper order. And uh, unto Adam he said, verse 17, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife. And because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife. And God is not insinuating, he's telling a truth. Uh, he made a decision. He listened to the voice of his wife. We know that Adam was not deceived. It tells us a little bit later on in the Bible that Adam was not deceived. And uh, we think about that. He, the proper order in the Bible, let all things be done decently in order. But in Ephesians chapter 5, it tells us, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, and even as Christ is the head of the church. And it's important. In 1 Timothy, if you'll turn over to 1 Timothy chapter 2, I want you to see this. There's a proper order here. Boy, the, the devil came to, the serp, uh, to Eve and told her a lie. She believed the lie. And 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 11. It says, Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach nor usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. And then it gives us some inside information here. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived. Do you see that? Who was deceived? The woman was. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression right there. Now, now this right here, we live in a politically correct world, right? Where you begin to talk about something like this, the proper order. And uh, we talk about the the man leading a home, being the head of the home. We talk about uh, Adam right there not being deceived and the woman was deceived. We sound like male chauvinist pigs, but in reality, if we're not careful, we have been listening to the world more than to the word of God. And uh, there is a proper order. God created man first. Uh, a woman was to help the man. In other words, gender distinction matters. God had a purpose for a woman. God had a purpose for a man. And we've got to make sure that we, we live our lives in proper order, proper order. Uh, who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her so that he shall have no need of spoil. Uh, she will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. Now, I was, I've been reading some biographies lately, and uh, one of the biographies was speaking of a, a great pastor of the past named George Truett, and uh, got married at a young age, and uh, married uh, for over 50 years, and his wife was profusely loyal to her husband. He, and and it, 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 she wasn't in bondage. They made a great team. She helped him serve the Lord. She encouraged him to serve the Lord. 
and that's not a bad thing. And I want to just make sure that that's not a bad thing for a woman to help a man. And at the end of his life, he, he died before she did. She lived for uh, many years afterwards. And boy, she was profusely loyal even after his death. A new pastor came to that church, W.A. Criswell. And you know what? She didn't like him as much as she liked her husband pastoring. And did she cause a little bit of trouble for her? Yeah. Why? Because she was profusely loyal to her husband. And I think George threw up in heaven was like, get him, get him right there. And didn't mind one bit. And uh, proper order is not bad. And I want to say it again, proper order is not bad. Adam should not have listened to his, her, his wife at that period of time. Adam was not deceived. And another one I read about B.H. Carroll. Boy, got married at a young age. And uh, his wife uh, helped in the home. And as I read this biography, it was written by his uh, brother, J.M. Carroll. His wife, uh, he worked hard. He studied. He cared for her. He had balance. He had respect for her. He, uh, there was a mutual respect. They loved each other. They made a great team. She wasn't in bondage. Uh, she was a homemaker who loved and helped her husband. And it was a glorious thing. It wasn't a bad thing. The outside world today, oh, you male chauvinist pigs, but don't listen to the outside world. We ought to listen to the Bible. Boy, you ought not li- rule with an iron fist. If your wife doesn't want to follow you 90% of the time, it's because you're not a very good husband, okay? Uh, you're a bum. Uh, but boy, when you treat her with respect, you treat her as a queen, you honor her, you help her, uh, boy, you encourage her, boy, and you provide for her, you uh, stand firm on God's word, it makes it easy for her to follow you and want to help you. And most of the problem is not the woman, it is the man right there, B.H. Carroll. Uh, Now, when things get out of order, there's problems. I read an article this week, and I I believe it was Monday, a famous pastor in Virginia, boy, in in charge of a large college, and uh, boy, his son, he raised with different standards than he preached. Uh, He'd preach against alcohol, and then it was no big deal for his son to drink alcohol. And then all of a sudden, in the big college, his son went off and wasn't an independent Bible-believing Baptist like he was, and then he hired him to help the college when the college was in distress. And here he is, is working in the college, and he eventually became the the college, uh, after his dad died, he became the uh, president of that college, but wasn't a Bible-believing Baptist like we would think. And as things evolve right there, nothing wrong with drinking, nothing wrong with uh, uh, R movies, nothing wrong with sin. Uh, And publicly, he he would put on a front, but privately it wasn't like that. And then the relationship in the home and the order of husband and wife and the story goes into adultery and fornication and a downfall and drunkenness. Boy, you get things out of order. Sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. You know, you look back at B.H. Carroll, boy, it's a glorious relationship, not just for him, but for his wife. Uh, you look back at George True, it wasn't just a good relationship for George True, it was a great relationship for his wife. Boy, proper order matters. It's not bondage, it's a blessing. And we go to this next uh, things, the difficulties of life. Look at verse number 18. Oh, because of the sin, thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, And thou shalt eat the herb of the field, the difficulties of life. By the way, sin, because of Adam's transgression, there are difficulties of life. Adam was going to have a lot more difficulties than he would have had in that Garden of Eden. Uh, Boy, uh, before sin, woo, man, blessings. He didn't have to care for much right there. He didn't have to care about those thorns and thistles. But after the sin, thistles were now a part of his life. There's a curse with sin. By the way, if we could just remember, uh, when we are are in tune with God's word, following God's word, there's a blessing. The blessing, Lord, to make with rich. But your sin, my sin, when we sin, when we willfully sin, when we even sin, uh, and you know maybe we don't even pay attention to it, there's consequences to it. It brings thorns and thistles. But man that is born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. You know, we're not going to reform this world today. You know, there's a coming day when Jesus is going to be, uh, praise God, during the millennial reign, he's going to uh, rule this world. 
But right now, this, this world is seemingly getting darker and darker and darker, is it not? Life is full of problems and difficulties. It's not fair, but it's life. An example of that, my, my son Nehemiah got a little yellow Tonka truck and Boy, when the snow came, he put snow in that Tonka truck and pushing around. We put Amos in the Tonka truck and pushed him across the floor, and he's happy-go-lucky. Had the Tonka truck stored in his room, and the other day, all of a sudden, we heard this crash, boom, and Amos had picked up that Tonka truck and hit my Nehemiah over the head. And uh, when Nehemiah was hurt right there, uh, Amos got scared and was crying, and they're both crying. And I went in there, and I looked at uh, Nehemiah, and I said, son, he's not bleeding. I said, life's not fair. Uh, get over it. Well, he said, Amos hit me on the head. I said, well, get used to it. You're going to get hit over the head a lot. Because this side of eternity, life's not fair, and it's okay. And uh, we have difficulties and struggles. It's just this side of eternity. Uh, I was talking about B.H. Carroll. I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking with uh, about B.H. Carroll. B.H. Carroll at a young age, born in uh, 1837. Uh, he began to read at a young age, and he became an avid reader. Over 50 years, the last 50 years of his life, he averaged reading one book a day, 300 pages long. And uh, boy, he became a very fast reader, but he was an avid reader in a young age. He would sometimes read well into the night. He'd get by the fire back then and read and read and read. He was very self-educated. By the way, uh, some of the books he read were not Christian books. He began to read books by infidels. And uh, though his dad was a pastor, he became an infidel. And there's an in interesting book that was written, My Infidelity and What Became of It. He had joined the uh, Civil War for the South. But B.H. Uh, Carroll, as he joined the army in the South, these books that he had read turned his heart away from God, had turned his heart away from the Word of God. And uh, boy, uh, it's so sad. As he began to join the army in the South, he uh, joined the, 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 it was actually not the, the South uh, he became a Texas Ranger. Part of the South, he was to go take care of Indians and the forts uh, that were, were guarding the citizens from the Indians. But he loved books, and he got away one time where he was fishing for trout, and he got lost in Indian country. And he began to try to find his way back, and he couldn't find his way back. And he would hear sounds, but he was scared to shoot the gun. And uh, boy, he began to hide, and he was very, very scared. And next thing you know, he heard some people, and he didn't know if it was going to be the Indians or it was going to be soldiers, so he shot his gun, and then all of a sudden he noticed Indians, and he went and hid in a cave, and then the Indian came right in front of him, and he was, took the gun out, was about to shoot the Indian until he realized it really wasn't an Indian, it was actually one of the uh, scouts for the army, and boy, he jumped out of there, and he began weeping and bawling and crying because he was lost in the wilderness. He never knew if he'd find, find his way, way out. Uh, Civil War, war. He, he eventually made it back and they took him away from the Texas Rangers and he went to war and uh, not long into the war he got shot in the leg. Missed the artery, missed the bone, but he couldn't walk very well. And by the way, that getting shot in the leg the way he did, they said one out of five people survived the infection and the sickness. And it wasn't just months of recovery, it was years of recovery. And there was a lot of things he couldn't do. He, he got back, his dad had just died, his mom's there, he can't make a living very well, he can't work, he's like one of the men that's back and he's wounded right there. He feels helpless, but by, by the way, that's the way life is. Life has difficulties. If you have, in other words, I'm, man, I'm trying to get to a point. If you have difficulties, you're normal. Uh, life wasn't meant to be easy. If you have struggles, it's normal. Well, it's hard to get a job. Well, it's going to be hard getting a job. It's hard to keep a job. Good. It, you're normal. It's okay. Well, I have to work long hours. Good. Work long hours. Uh, you know, sometimes we struggle. It's difficult for me to read. Well, good. It's difficult for everybody. To learn to read. Difficulties are part of life, and that's okay. It's okay for life to be difficult, which leads to this one, the reality of work. Verse 19, in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread. And this is the reality of work. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread. Adam, you know what? You're going to have to work now to eat bread. You know what you're, you have to do today? You have to work to eat bread. Uh, in Th 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10, for even... When we were with you, this we commanded that if any would not work, neither should he eat. By the way, communism's bad. Uh, the free handouts are bad. Uh, we get used to these stimulus checks and 
all sorts of different things right there, and, and it leads us away from working. We have an epidemic of people that didn't even understand what work is, but that, that, that can be the way it is with the world, but not with us Christians. Boy, men, you ought to learn to work and work hard and work's okay. Work's not bad. It's okay. The sweat of your face, it's okay. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 11, or verse 12. You ever heard of Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12? Very famous verse. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Do you know what the verse before that is? Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. You know, this side of eternity, we got to work. You know, work for the Lord, yes, but it's not bad to have a job. And we ought to labor, therefore, to enter into that rest. That rest is when we get to that side of eternal eternity. B.H. Carroll, after the Civil War, in his early 20s, uh, boy, praise the Lord, he, he went to a revival meeting. The Lord got a hold of his heart, praise the Lord, and got gloriously saved. Shortly after that, he immediately got into preaching and uh, got to preach the gospel, praise the Lord. But, but, you know, he wasn't supported by being a preacher. He became a school teacher. And uh, schools were different back then. He would go into a community and he would start a school. He'd find a place that didn't have a school. He'd get a place to have a school. And then he would charge a dollar a month to teach. And one out of six people would pay. He'd let anybody come. They were to pay a dollar a month. But most people didn't pay. Only one out of six would pay. And that wasn't a very good leading. Uh, uh, wasn't it very good uh, to feed the family, you might say. But uh, it was okay. And by the way, it's interesting. Education back there wasn't about getting a diploma. And that's another fallacy that we have today. The education was to learn something. And those soldiers coming back, and uh, you, you would want to learn something, and he would teach them things that would help them live this side of eternity. Sometimes we get a diploma and say, look what I got. And, uh, you know, we, we have a, a really weird philosophy on a diploma. I, and I, I'm, I'm guilty. In high school, I didn't care about an education. I cared about a diploma. So I did a lot of things to cheat on tests and everything like that, and I got my diploma, but I didn't get an education. And then I realized my education was not about a diploma, it was about learning so I could serve the Lord. And that, that's a whole other subject right there. And uh, the reality of work and education, a dollar a month, not one in six pay, but then he'd preach. The reality of work, he then began to farm and preach. He began to start a farm. And you know, it, it, sometimes it's difficult. He started a farm and he began to farm crops right there. And then he, he had a, a black thumb. It just didn't work out. And uh, they used to have a term, raising the barn. And he, a bunch of people would come help him. And the, uh, eventually the cotton fields, he couldn't hire laborers. And so the cotton that he had began to just die out right there. And so they, they began to uh, get the community to come out and uh, have a week where they were going to help him harvest the car, ca cotton. And all the neighbors uh, were obliged to help because he was preaching to them. So they provided a huge meal. And then as they were going to spend a week to help him harvest, all of a sudden they looked out and this huge storm came. And they describe it where it was like a hand that came out of the sky that became black and it began to thunder and lightning and it began to just completely pour and uh, rain and thunder. And, you know, everybody's happy because they had the big meal. But it ruined all the farm, the, the, all of the, the crops. It was difficult. It's not fair. He's a preacher. How can you let me to have it? He didn't worry about that. Because he knew out of the sweat of his face he needed to earn a living. And it was okay if things didn't exactly work. He didn't give up on God. He didn't criticize God. He kept preaching. And God worked things out eventually. Look at this, the verse 19. Look at verse 19. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thy return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken. Now look at this. For dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. And this is the reality of eternal life, heaven. He's just saying this side of eternity is short. In reality, one day you're, you're going to have another, uh, another chapter in your life. It's eternal life. And uh, you know that song, when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. You know, the reality is this side of eternity is very short, but the other side of eternity is very, very long. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8, For we are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. And then you know what's the next verse? To be absent with the body and to be present with the Lord. Do you know what the next verse is? So it's crazy. It says this, Wherefore we labor. 
because this side of eternity is short, we're going to get busy. We're going to take every day we've been given by the Creator, by God, and use it to His honor and glory. Boy, if you work, work hard. Boy, you work hard for the Lord, work hard. Brother Mike Willis, I, you know, 61. Brother, Brother Eugene, 61. Boy, a good man. The bread ministry, you know, you bring bread to our church, feed most of our families with bread. And uh, boy, worked hard, worked hard. I feel bad because over here, our sidewall right there, he wanted to put capstone on there. And he came by about 100 times and he said, Pastor, when are we going to get the capstone? I want to put the capstone on those. And then I just, we just didn't get the capstone. It just didn't happen. And so every time I go by there now, I think of missed opportunity for Brother Mike. He wanted to work. He wanted to help right there. Last night as I was with the family and they took the ventilator out, took those two gasps, gone. You know, but, but to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Boy, he, he was unshackled. Uh, unshackled from this side of eternity now. Man, look it up there. He's got no more breathing problems, no more cancer. Boy, praise God. I, I can see him excited and thankful. He's part of that great cloud of witnesses right there. You know, for you and I, we have to remember, we've got a short period of time this side of eternity. Boy, that side of eternity, it's ever, forever. Ever and ever and ever. And praise the Lord. And, and you're no different. You're going to die. You know, we, you may not die today. You don't know. Uh, but you're not promised another day, another year. But no matter what, for all of us, it's short. It's short. The reality of heaven and eternal. Now, I want to look at this. Verse number 20. This is the last part. And Adam called his wife, his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord make coats of skins and clothed them. You know, God's mercy. And praise God for his mercy. When I, when I say mercy, he treats us better than we deserve to be treated. Uh, he treats you, he treats me better than we, to be des be, we deserve to be treated. It, it, earlier, you know why he clothed them with skins? Because the fig leaves were not good enough. Do you remember in verse number seven, in the middle ward, they sewed fig leaves together <laughs> and made themselves aprons. They said those little aprons, those short shorts were not good enough. We need to get you a coat on right there. You guys are looking a little immodest, a little naked here. We need, and uh, they, they, God helped them out. Why? Because God's merciful. And uh, by the way, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. I will bruise thy head. He's telling Satan this, and thou shalt produce his heel. And in God's mercy that he sent his only begotten son to die on the cross for our sins. Uh, born of a virgin, lived a perfect life, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And praise God, we're saved. How? By God's mercy. How are we saved? Because God treats us better than we deserve to be treated. We deserve to die and go to hell. But praise God, we're bound for heaven because of his mercy. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Praise God for his mercy. Men, we're going to be closing, but here, here's what I want you to think about. The difficulties of life get used to it. You get hit on the head with one of those, those yellow trucks right there. And uh, boy, it's no fun, but it's just life. You're normal. Uh, it's not that anybody's against you. It's just this side of eternity is full of trouble. Amen. Then work, work hard, work hard, work hard, work hard, work hard. Men, work hard for the Lord. Boy, work hard. Then also, remember the last part right there, or the first part that we started. Hey, don't be deceived by the devil. Adam was not deceived. Amen? Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we love you. We thank you, Lord, for allowing us to work. Boy, every day is a privilege. Sometimes people don't realize what a gift life is. They take it for granted. They uh, waste days. They waste months. They waste years. And they throw their life away. And then it's awful. Some people even get to the point where they take that gift and destroy it by killing themselves. And boy, it's so disrespectful to you, the gift of life that you've given those few days. Lord, I pray that you help us to appreciate that gift of life. It may be full of trouble, but help us to understand that trouble's okay. 
Uh, we may have to work hard and have some sweat, but that's okay. And Lord, I pray you help us as a church not to look to the world for those answers, but look to the Bible for answers. We sure do love you. Thank you for this good day. In Jesus' name, amen.